Come with some bright idea, sneak out between the two talks and fill in the form, because that will be your last opportunity. And then anyone here who is giving a lightning talk, um, please meet with Simon Cross in the big room uh, 10 minutes before the end of the tea break. Uh, with that, I think it's now time to start the session. So our first talk will be Our Journey to Kiwi by Richard Logan. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Great to be here amongst so many Pythonistas. Um, I'm going to be talking about a framework I discovered about 10 months ago. I think it's really exciting because it delivers on the promise of Python everywhere. Um, Windows, Linux, Mac, Android, Raspberry Pi, iOS. Basically, if it's got a Linux kernel and touch input, you can probably run Kivy on it. So, just going to quickly jump in. Okay. Originally, I was going to make this talk, Our Journey to Kiwi, but that's pretty boring, actually. I'd much rather focus on Kiwi. Our journey can pretty much be just described in a few sentences. We're historically a VB6 development house. When .NET came along, we said, yuck, we really don't like that. Um, and we looked at various options. About four years ago, we kind of centered on Python. But you know, then you have a whole lot of extra choices. What widget tool set are we going to use? And plus, each has its own sort of idiosyncrasies and deployment problems. Um, and then about 10 months ago, we discovered Kiwi. Um, so I'm just going to basically do a quick aerial view, flying over, just giving you an idea of what the framework can do, not trying to get into too much detail. So um, I'm going to make some terrible mistakes, throw too much information on you, put too much text on the screen, all of those things, because I basically I just want to spark your interest and <laughs> convince you that this is something you really should be looking at if you want to run everywhere. OK, let's look at that's the official Kiwi website. Cross-platform, business-friendly. GPU accelerated, funded by the community. Kiwi is, used to be LGPL licensed. About a month ago, the devs very kindly made it MIT. So basically, you have no worries as a commercial company. You can mod it, sell it, distribute it. It takes away kind of all of those issues for you. OK, official reasons to choose Kiwi. Kiwi is fresh. OK, Kiwi basically is optimized for running on the GPU. Um, you'll see it uses Scython and um, to compile to C, so there's no interpreter. And it's designed to also make much use of the GPU as possible. So it compiles also to use, to use OpenGL. So that means you get very fluid, very quick, very responsive interfaces. Um, you know, animations you get for free. Um, and you'll see, I'll show you some code later to see exactly how easy that is. As I said, it's very fast because it uses Cython, so there's no interpreter. It's running straight C sp speed. It's also an incredibly flexible and well-designed framework. You'll see it's very OOP-driven. And they've actually hijacked a few Python things to actually really implement a, a, a tremendously easy to use event binding system. Um, so, and that helps with a lot of, with a lot of things. It's, a, it's the implementation of the observer pattern, basically using a normal Python property. It's really incredibly powerful and very elegant. Um, and using it also helps with a lot of other design patterns. You know, using that event driven, you also get, you, makes it easier to separate concerns, makes it also easier to, to, to implement single responsibilities. And it also, has a declarative language called the KV language, which I'll basically show you quickly as well. And that allows you to separate your UI code from your, your actual running code, or your UI from your code. So it's another very good practice. OK. Yes, as I said, Kivi is a really awesome framework. It's, it's a complete, and it's actually much more um, than just a toolkit. It gives you a complete Python um, standard library with all your kind of <coughs> Python modules. It also comes with an additional rich set of libraries, like factories um, for the factory pattern it's clock to handle the async. Um, it's got an atlas for image. It's got a full logger with full purging and all of the nice things you'd be expect there. It also has a rich set of OS and device abs abstractions. So because um, yeah, it's built to be cross-platform from the beginning, you're separated from things like screen densities, metrics, input providers, core providers. Kibi's wrapped all of those things in core abstractions, so you don't really have to care what device is giving you input or what's happening. So, and it almost gives you a complete OS abstraction. It's also got an awesome property and event dispatching mechanism, which I'll just cover because that forms a lot of the basis of Kibi. Plus, it's also got a set of modules for assisting in developing and debugging. Nice sets of tools that sort of make it very easy to work and maintain. Um, it's also got a very nice extensibility system, which you can do in two ways. There can be extensions. So if, for example, if you want to add something like, say, a PDF, um, you can package that, put that in a uh, Kiwi package and ship, it with Kiwi, and ship it with. It's also extensible through something called the Kiwi Garden, which is also maintained actually by the community. Um, Kiwi itself is also, also on GitHub, 
but generally, I mean, they're, they're quite, uh, they monitor the commits and you know, only a few of the core devs have that power. The garden is basically there to, so the community can control and add whatever widgets or extensions they like. And then it's very easy to pull through a little command line tool those into your Kivi installation. It's also stable, proven, well designed, and it's really sexy. I really recommend you go after this to the gallery and look at some of the apps. It's really exciting, and you'll see why it actually provides you with a really nice, responsive, and very sexy interface. Okay, Kivi also provides some nice extra tools that make it easy to do things that can be, you know, that can block your UI. Um, you know, for example, if you're running a background process, typically your UI is going to lock. So Kibi provides a lot of nice, thoughtful sort of methods that allow you to do sort of blocking stuff in a background thread. You'll see it's got a URL request, which basically runs in the background, and then you get a callback when the background is done, or the, 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 that URL is loaded. So that means you get nice background loading of your images and text, and it just pops into your UI when it's ready. There's no blocking. There's nothing stopping your, you know, that responsive interface. Async image, you see that also it's a direct widget. You basically just give it a source and it loads that image in the background and plops it, you know, displays it when it's ready. Um, there's another example of animation. Same thing, I mean, and look at how minimal that code is. You basically say, okay, I want an animation. You must change the X to 50, the Y to 200 over two seconds. You say, okay, on complete, please call me a callback so you can do something. You don't need that. And then you just say anim.start. And that's literally all the code you need to have to do animations. Um, you can specify extra parameters for the, the physics of it, like elastic bounce. There's really a, and you can even add your own kinds of physics to that by customizing, well, by subclassing. I think it's an it's animation property. And then you can, yeah, implement your own physics. So it's really nicely thought out, really extensible. Um, yes, there's just a few things I want to go into first because it's, Kivi is quite different. And especially coming from a, you know, using a normal toolkit like WX or GTK, there's a few things in Kivi that you think, Wow, what, that's not what I expected. Why isn't it doing something? So I just want to cover those because a lot of those des design decisions affect the framework in, in quite a complex way. And, quite, and it's important to kind of just, I think, up front establish what those are and why it's different. Okay, so the first difference um, is Kivi is basically, it's, it's implemented in OpenGL. So it's not a canvas. When you draw a red line, you're not really drawing a red line. Kivi is basically running in parallel a set of OpenGL instructions on the GPU your Python is in, is in normal RAM. So basically, when you update a widget property, for example, you, off, you often don't see that change automatically um, because you're changing your Python representation of the object, but the graphical, but the, the, the instructions that are actually rendering it are on the GPU. So you need to basically, and can we do binding between that? So when you change, for example, the widget property, it updates the, the physical representation on the GPU. Kivi does that very nicely using the observer pattern. Um, and the, yes, which I'll show you just now. Okay, so that's the first gotcha. Got a, a widget, it's, you know, you move it to pause, doesn't change on the screen. It's still in the same, same area. Again, that's because it's, you're not changing the, the OpenGL instructions, you're changing the, the Kivi ob, the, the object. So Kivi's got two ways of doing that. You can manually bind um, your properties, it gets a bit clumsy. So Kibi provides a very nice language called the KB language to, to automate that binding for you. Um, it has the added advantage, of course, and then you've got a declarative language where you do your UI, your code is quite separate. Okay, so here we go an advantage. If, if, for example, if you'd want to manually bind, you have a widget, it's got a size, it's got a position, but now that's on the GPU, so when you basically, that position changes, you want to know. When it's moved, you want to know, so you basically do that by binding callbacks. So there's your widget, you say, on. When your position changes, do that callback. When the size changes, do that callback. So that's one way of doing it. As I said, it does become a bit clumsy. Um, and that's when they offer the KV language. And it's a best practice for many reasons. That first is that it does that binding for you automatically, separates your UI. It's also very quick and easy to throw together um, a, a nice UI once you understand it. Um, so it, it actually really becomes quite a bonus once, once, once you master the language and understand why it's there. Okay, another fundamental difference of Kivi. Kivi comes from a rich history of multi-touch. It used to, it started out as a project called PyMT, which as you can see there. And what happened in about 2010, the devs wanted to change a lot of things and optimize it. So they basically, and that, that optimizing would have broken compatibility. So they created Kivi from, from scratch, new design, highly optimized. And what they also did is basically load the OpenGL requirements to OpenGL ES. 
So that basically means it's going to run on almost any device and mobile devices because it's a, a sub subset of OpenGL, as, OpenGL built for mobiles, or especially with mobiles in mind. So the second gotcha. Okay, we've got a widget A is in the side widget B. Why on earth is it in the bottom left corner? Um, okay, true to understanding that is that because it comes from a touch-first background, it has a different paradigm. It's not about little rectangles on a screen. That's not how other widget toolkits work. But Kivi allows you to use the whole, your whole OpenGL service in any way you want. So it doesn't force or constrain you to rectangles, or you, know, you, you get a very freeform composition of your UI. Um, and that, again, is because, yeah, let's just go over that. Why in touch do certain paradigms die? Is because normal, you know, like a button. You click in the area, and only the button that you clicked in the area would get that event. Um, that's not the way it works in Kiwi. When you click, basically any widget on the screen anywhere can subscribe and get that event. Because basically swipe ins, you, you couldn't do with that paradigm. So Kiwi drops those assumptions and lets, it gives you total control over what is on the screen, what receives events. And it does this in a very nice way and allows you to control that using the event binding. Which we'll get to here. Another thing just to mention there is because of that, also visual representations of the widget aren't restricted to where they are. For example, a parent can have a child, and that child can still draw and do its display itself anywhere. It's also really nice, um, so flexible. It also allows you to work in almost a layered way, where you can just put layers on top and draw wherever you want, and you're not constrained to having to fit into a, a, a widget area. Here we go. That's the second difference I was mentioned. Hey, wherever I click, all the widgets on touch event, on touch down events fire goes back to that idea that an attach, you know, you can't constrain input to a rectangle. So we throw that away and we say any widget can listen to an event. All it just needs to do is ask for the binding and there we go. You've got, a, you've got an easy way to hook up your widgets to your event. Okay, how do we do that? We do that by applying the observer pattern. So we basically request to listen to an event and we get a notification when it arrives. Um, it's also very flexible. It doesn't prescribe, as I said, it doesn't prescribe how, you have, how your events are handled. It lets you do that, just like plugging things in together. So it really puts you in control. So it's one re thing I really appreciate about Kivi as a framework. You know, a lot of frameworks, they're designed to sort of solve a problem for you, and they're great if that's just the way you want to solve it. The moment you try to do things differently, you often find frameworks you know, get in the way because they're dictating a way of working. Kiwi's really, I found, not like that at all. The more you discover it, the more amazed you are at how flexible it, it is. It's really nice to use. Okay, so let's get dirty. Um, let's look at some code. Almost all of the challenges Kiwi faces are solved in an elegant and consistent way by using that observer pattern. But ironically, by solving this, way, this, this problem in such a nice way, they've really made the framework a pleasure to use. So let's see how they do that. Okay, here we have sort of standard Python property, okay, using decorators. So, okay, we've got a hidden property, text. We've got a text method decorated property. And then we've got a text.setter. You know, that's pretty cryptic to me. Um, plus all the decorators. And you've got two methods called text. You know, it's, it doesn't strike me as very Pythonic. So is there another way to do it? Yes, there is. We could use the, the Python property. So we've now got a hidden method. Oh, sorry, a hidden variable, and we've got two methods, a uh, setter and a getter, and we have to now combine them um, with a property. So it's like four things now. Um, surely there's a better way. Yes, Kivi does it in one line. Text equals string property. It's really that simple. Um, it looks like a static method, but actually it's bound to each element of your class by Kivi in the background. That's part of the magic that it works. So it's, it's magically there and instantiated with all of your, with class instances. So if you want to listen to that event's change, you simply add it on text, and there you've got it. No extra work at all. Um, so it's really very nice to work with. And once you get the hang of it, you oof, using normal Python properties, doesn't look so good anymore. OK, let's look at another example of properties. Here we've got a, we want to restrict um, that property. I mean, that's why we use getters and setters, so we have some control over what that property has changed to. So we insta in our instantiation, we give it a min minimum limit, maximum limit. Then we define a getter, a setter, and we raise that error if it's, um, if, if it's out of bounds. And looking at the equivalent in Kivi, see it's one line. You just subclass an event dispatcher. 
that event dispatcher is the class that basically done, does all this event um, plumbing for you. Um, that's one example of a bounded numeric property. You get many different kinds of properties, string properties, object properties, um, you can, and you can even create your own kind of properties for custom classes if you want. So it's really flexible and it's really nicely solved. It makes the whole framework very easy to plumb and work with. Um, here we go, here's an example of Kibi as the event dispatches. So, uh, so we have a callback, okay, and then we create an inst an instance of my class, which you see has a numeric property. Um, and there we just attach, we bind that callback. So we just go to the object.bind, when A changes, please call that callback. And you'll see it's one method, you don't have a getter and a setter. You've simply got a nice callback, this has changed, this is its new value. And you see that call get back gets past the instance of the object and the value it's, of its, that it's changing to. So really, really nicely done. That is, it helps in many ways. Also optimizes because it reuses a lot of space for memory if different instances reference the same object. They just, uh, it, only it only allocates memory for that object. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the event binding mechanism. Let's look at how Kibi does kit touch, because this is also one of the things that really differentiated as a, as a platform. It's got a rich pedigree of experience, and you can really see it. It makes touch very, very easy to work with. So basically, you know, the standard ones, you've got a on touch down, on touch move, on touch up. Okay, now each of those events um, gets passed a touch object, which is a very rich and useful representation of a touch. It's not just X and Y coordinates. Um, it has a whole lot of other metadata attached to you, which the engine, auto, which can be automatically provides for you. Um, it's a specialized instance of a motion event class, um, and these are generated by your abstracted input providers. So let's look at some of those properties. You've got clearing of graphics, you've got your double tap time, you've got your, your change in X, your change in Y, your change in Z, you've got a grab state. I'll go over the grab state just now, because grabs are how you basically get hold of a touch. And then once you grab a touch, you basically guarantee to receive, guarantee to receive all of those events thereafter. Um, normally that would be by bubbling down and up and down the widget hierarchy. Um, the moment a function would return true, um, then that event would stop bubbling. Um, but grabbing a touch allows you to ensure that you get, always get those events. Um, scale, you say you've got on touch down, you've got double tap time, triple tap, is tap. You've also got a shape, which basically returns a string indicating for you what kind of shape they've drawn. The moment that's only, imp only imp implemented for a rectangle, but I'll show you how easy it is to sort of do your own shapes. Um, interesting thing I want to point out here is that notice it's got a Z, because Kibi actually to supports 3D input. So Kinect is a supported device, as is um, the Leap Motion. So that's really exciting, you know, because um, there's a lot you can do with that. A lot of possibilities for developing, especially if you consider how basically, I mean, easy it is to plug in surfaces and devices to Kibi. Um, a lot of exciting possibilities there. So, yes, here's how we grab an event. You can grab an event if you want to be guaranteed to receive the on touch down, on touch up. It normally, as I said, works through bubbling. So that just allows you to and have more fine grained control. Um, here's a code example. Um, so you'll see the on touch down. So we use, as I said, because any, any widget can get input from anywhere in the screen, if you want to see if it's inside that widget, you use the, the widgets.collide point event and you just part, unpack the touch um, x, y um, and then basically that returns true if it's within the widgets, false if it's outside of the widget. So if we, it's inside the widget we do a grab and we return true indicating that we've handled the touch and from then on that on touch move event will fire all the time. Then when we do on touch up we say okay I'm done with this touch, you ungrab the touch and you're done. So very easy to handle events. Um, yeah. So touch is great but how do we use it for detecting gestures? Um, converting in point, um, po inputs, input points into gestures is really challenging mathematically. You know, there's a lot of um, variation, there's a lot of variables. You're getting a stream of um, input which you have to analyze, so it would typically be quite complex to do. Kibi makes it really simple. So let's look at an example for that. Um, gesture recognition. So there we create a new gesture, we add a point list, we normalize it, we give it a name, and that's a gesture. Kibi now understands what the gesture is. That in itself is cool, but it still would be clumsy to work with. So Kivi provides a gesture database, which is really, really nice. Um, because basically that allows you to define touches or gestures, store them, and then you can just ask that, um, 
ask that gesture database, do you have a matching touch? Do you, and if it does, it gives it to you, and you've got its name, and you actually now understand what that gesture is. So that makes it really easy. What makes it even easier is the fact that you can, in Kibi, you can record touches, store them to that gesture database, and then just query that database later. So here this is quite long. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But if you look, it's actually very simple. Um, on touch down, you've got a um, the touch, your touch is your touch object, and you've got a UD, which is basically a dictionary you can use to store your own user data. On the touch down, you start the line. On the touch move, you basically just add the points of your touch to that line. Um, then on touch up, you basically create a, um, a simple gesture from that um, and store it to a database, give it a name, and then you've got a, a database that you can look up against. Um, Kivi does all of that normalization comparison for you all in the background, so it makes it really dead easy to use touch in an exciting way because you can now define your own gestures entirely, record them, and you've got a nice algorithm that automatically matches input to that. Okay. So enough t uh, talking now. I'm just going to um, show you the quick widget tool set that Kibi comes with. I'm going to do that using uh, the Python po the, the, the portable Kibi um, package. Um, Kibi's packaged in various ways depending on your OS. So this is the portable one. I'm actually running Python 2.6 by nature. Kibi's 2.7, but that doesn't matter. It's all encapsulated in a portable package, um, which is just this folder unzipped. Nothing in store. You'll see it's GStreamer included there for your video and audio. Um, there's your Kibi source code, you go to the examples, and there's your Python distribution, your Cython interpreter. So in an IDE, for example, if you want to set it up, you just come at here pointed to this interpreter. Um, there are three extra uh, environment variables which you need to add to basically get it running in an interpreter. But um, once that's done, you can use Kibi in, in most IEs, IDEs. So let's go into the Kibi folder. You'll see it comes with a nice thing called examples. And here are a full set of examples demonstrating the various abilities of Kibi. So we're going to go into the, um, the showcase. And just, just so you can get an idea of what um, widgets uh, Kibi comes with, there's some really nice ones. Um, see there, just running in the background, I just want to explain that that's your Kibi logger. Works really nicely. Um, it's there, there enabled by default for you. Um, you can switch it on and off for the config, obviously, when you want to deploy. But it's also really nice. Works, I mean, on Android, you see that spat out to your console. Um, in iOS, you see that all, that all that logging appearing in Xcode all works without you really having to do anything. So, okay, so here's our Kibi showcase. So, so you've got our standard buttons over here, up button, up down, toggle buttons. Got some sliders there, some uh, progress bar over here, a switch, uh, switch widget. Got some radio option buttons there, tick box, text inputs. You know, fairly standard, um, what you'd expect. Here we have some more complex widgets. Um, we've got an accordion, that nice sliding out effect. Um, that kind of panel pop out. Notice that it's all smooth, all animated. There we've got a file browser. You'll see there we can step through the files. We've got um, icons of our files here. Um, so there you've got a built-in file browser. More complex widgets. Here's a color picker. Where you RGBA, all of that thing to generate your various colors. Um, here we have a scatter. This is another widget that makes um, Kivi really powerful. Okay, it looks like I can just drag and move that around. Um, but this is built for multi-touch, and Kivi simulates that. Um, you can simulate that using a mouse. When I right-click here, and I stop shaking, you're going to see that red point appears. Now that acts as a touch and hold. So once I've done that, I can basically now move that around, spin that around as if it's a second finger. So it allows you to test gestures um, and that kind of thing on um, right there on your on your window and I mean in your app without having to have touch um, let me just run that again yes yeah, so that makes it uh, really nice also you can drop anything onto a scatter so you can have a whole widget hierarchy or UI just drop it onto a scatter and you get that kind of rotation free um, yeah you've got tree views um, normal tree view items those use adapters, so you can also customize that and add your own kind of things. Font sizes, relatively standard. Um, the, uh, Kibi does fonts really excellently. I'll get to that later. And you've got a pop-up, which is like your typical message box kind of thing. Um, the nice thing about a pop-up um, is that you can basically put anything into it. Um, it's not like a, just a normal net message box. It takes a basically a content, um, but you can put anything in that content. You can have a whole hierarchy of widgets nested and just pop it into a pop-up 
there you go. And you'll see there we have some of our layout controls. Um, got an anchor layout, which is a basic where you attach widgets to certain points. Box layout, which would kind of be what you expect, like it's in your normal GTK stack layout. Almost does horizontal, vertical orientation. A float layout, which is um, very freeform. You can basically position it anywhere. Nice thing about a float layout is you can, you've got multiple p options for positioning. You can use pixels, you can use, um, or you, if you use a float, a float between zero and one, that is basically representative of your, the, the proportion of your container. So then you can basically define layouts and widget sizes and coordinates as fractions of your whole layout. So it makes it very easy to scale, very easy and very natural to work with. Um, grid layout, which you'd expect now, you've just got rows and columns. Um, stack layouts, um, there you go, so you can just bomb them in and as you see that automatically arranges them. Um, and a relative layout, relative layout is very nice because whenever you move the container, the children move, move with it. Um, yeah, so that's very nice. Also, it's, it's quite important to use it, as you'll see, you'll get a sc you get free scrolling and bumps you know, and that uh, motion effect like you'd expect on a mobile device with Kibi. Um, using a relative layout there is pretty important because otherwise there's a lot of recalculation that has to happen on the widget positions. So the, the relative layout um, is, is, is really nice for that. It makes it much quicker and faster to execute. Okay, so let's get back. Okay, so that's basically a brief tour of the widgets. There's another really nice one is called a screen manager. But typically your Kibi app is basically one window um, with one screen. Um, if you want to move between, if you want to create different screens, you would use a screen manager which allows you to move between them. The really nice thing is for, for, with that you get free animation. Makes it really nice. You get slide-ins, you get swipes, you get bouncing in. All of those things you can also change and customize, as I said. So that, that just comes for free. Other notable widgets, the scatter I've just shown you. Um, really nice because it makes it incredibly easy to use multi-touch without really having to understand. You just bomb stuff into a scatter. It can be rotated by pinch zoom, all of those things. You'll see that it's trivial to create a scatter. Scatter objects, you just create it. You can see there's a do rotation. Um, that basically just, then it won't allow it to do rotation because by default it will let it, let it do anything. Do scale so it can't be zoomed. On translation, y equals false. So that scatter will basically only allow that widget to be slid along the x-axis. Um, give it a create an image, give it a source, and you just add it to the scatter and you're done. So really nice and it's really, very cool to be able to use multi-touch so easily. Okay, another nice widget is a code input widget, um, text input widget. Um, you'll see there that it recognizes um, both Python and the Kibi language. On the right there, you'll see the first example of the Kibi language. So it's creating a box layout, adding a tab panel, um, just putting the setting the tab pause, adding a few more tab panels, a file chooser, um, and a file a file chooser icon view. So the right gives you a UI, on the left you have your code. So it's also really nice having that separation. Here's a pop-up, just example. Um, as I say, incredible, incredibly flexibly, flexible because you can put anything in a pop-up. There we create one, we give it a title, we give it content, and as I said, that content can be anything. Um, give it a size hint, a pause hint, and then we say open. So very easy to create. If you want to um, react to events from that pop-up, you typically pass it an on-dismiss callback that gets called when, when the pop-up's dismissed. Layout, so you've got, it's got a full suite of layout. Very nice and easy, very pow powerful, and, f and very easy to create fluid, elegant UIs that scale. Because scaling can be quite a problem. Those layouts go as, pretty much as far as they can in order to make that easy, easy for you. As you say, because they're basically layouts, you don't get a guaranteed determined position. Um, you can request that if you want, but it's best to use the pause hint and size hint which basically then just give the, the container clues as to how to do the layout and where to put those, put those widgets. Um, so in terms of customizing widgets, yes, very easy. You can do it in various ways. You can create your own by all you have to really do is inherit the event dispatcher, or better, the widget which in turn inherits the event dispatcher. Or you can subclass and alter just by changing properties. Um, another option is all the Kibi graphics are pulled from an atlas, um, which is basically just a PNG with different areas demarcated. So then you do a dictionary lookup to get um, parts of that image. Um, so you can just replace that Kibi PNG with your own and give it give you your t totally your own look and feel. Um, yeah, here's the Kibi Garden, an example. So this is basically where people can go and add their own widgets. You can go and create your own widgets 
put them in the garden, and it's basically there for the rest of the world to use. It um, doesn't pollute the Kivian store. Um, a very, very nice um, way to handle it. There we can, we can see first line from the garden, install graph. Great, now we've got a graph widget. You want to upgrade it, there we go. Want to remove it, garden uninstall. Garden list shows you all the lists in the, all the widgets in the garden. Garden search, if you want to look for one. Garden search graph would be a lookup. Okay, I want something to do with graph, and then you'll get a, basically a printout to your console of all the matching widgets. So what's currently in the Kivy, Kivy Garden? There's quite a few nice things at the moment. There's, a lot, there's graphs, there's custom spinners, there's navigation drawers, date pickers. Um, the spinners are quite nice if you want to um, mimic a native um, app behavior. For example, the physics of uh, iOS is, is, is basically handled by, I think, the roulette spinner. So it gives you your same look and feel of um, you know, the physics of a notched kind of dial is it, that OS, iOS does. We've got some, a few other exciting ones. There's CE Python. It's an embedded Chromium browser um, using CEF Python. It's not yet stable. It currently only works on 64-bit Linux, but that's coming. Um, we've got a, there's a roulette one I've just mentioned, so it provides you your iOS physics. We've got a file chooser thumb view and a particle system. There's an awesome um, application actually in the Kibi Gallery called Particle Panda. Um, keep that's yeah, I think that uses that system. Really, really amazing app. Here's another one that's quite exciting. Um, it's being worked on by a guy in Summer of Code, a guy called Abhinav. He's working on this for his Google Summer of Code project. And you'll see basically that's a complete UI designer. Down the left you've got all your widgets that you want to add in. At the bottom you've got your KV Lang area where you can put code in if you want. You've got a console You've got a Python shell, and on the right you've got basically you know, your properties of your currently selected widgets, um, which you can drill down to, and the listing of your properties underneath. So that, um, I, I don't think that's yet stable as well, but that's coming. Really a nice, exciting project if you also have complex um, layouts you want to do and you don't necessarily want to use the, the KV Lang, you can use the designer. So Kibi provides amazing tools for development and debugging, and they are very easy to use and activate. Um, now, these are Kiwi modules. They actually are standard Python modules, but there's a certain way to use them that makes them very easy to just plug in and pull out of, of your, your app. Um, so, yeah, and you do that basically just by having a start method and a stop method, which is passed basically the containing window and the context. So, these modules currently include like touch ring, which just circles touch, monitor, which gives you your frames per second count, uh, readout, key binding, which basically allows you to sort of do hotkeys that apply all over. Um, recorder, recording and playback of events, really, really nice um, addition there, especially if you want to do some automated testing, um, because you can basically just start the recorder, do your clicking, your key presses, stop it, and you've got a recording of that sort of entire interaction. It's apparently not entirely, um, doesn't capture every subtlety of every event, but it's, from what I understand, it's highly effective nonetheless. Screen, to emulate different screens. That's uh, also really nice because t you know, catering on devices, d different device screens can be quite complex. Um, I'll get into that just now um, yeah, and show you some examples. There's an inspector, which is really, really cool. It uh, basically allows you to you have a UI and you can basically drill into your, into your UI um, by, in real time, seeing the properties of objects, getting their properties, changing them. Very, very cool. And a web debugger. So that's a real-time animation of your app internals via a web browser. That's personally one of my favorites. There we see it in action. So there's a web debugger. This is running basically alongside your app. The way this works is it's Kibi, um, that this Kivi module comes with um, an embedded microframework called um, Flask um, and an embedded small jQuery to sort of do the nice graphics. But yes, and then while your app is running, you're getting this, this printout debugging. So really nice because you see all your Python objects, your frames per second, all the while your app is running. So it also hints at another of the nice possibilities of Kivi that you know, you, it, it already has an embedded micro fra framework. So putting an embedded um, web server into Kivi is not, a, is not an issue. Um, another tool, here's the inspector module that I mentioned. Um, you can see in the background in the red, basically it's your currently selected widget. And on the bottom you can see you can drill down into all of its properties. Um, the do scroll, XY, all of those things live, and as you click, these things will change. You can also go up and down and drill down the widget hierarchy by, if you click on that button there, it would basically go to that widget and start inspecting that. So you get this nice interactive way to inspect your whole UI um, without any effort. So interactive launcher, ooh, let's go back to that. This is really nice. This is also one I've only just discovered. I'm also actually relatively new to Kivi. So I've just discovered this one, really nice. It basically allows you to run your app um, as an object and 
open it basically and access it live from a console. It also supports IPython. So basically, while your app is running live, you can have an IPython console to inspect, query. You, know, you get all your nice auto-complete and pop-up. Really nice. It's also got a way of, of basically for thread issues, for example, obviously in that scenario you've got a console where you're adding access, accessing memory, you've got your running app, so there are possible you know, contention issues and thread safety issues, but Kivi also um, comes with a safe membrane wrapper which you can use to basically t handle that synchronization for you. <coughs> yeah, so let's look at some of the other library Kivi's has got. Kivi really does have a full stack framework, it offers you so much. Animations and transitions, Atlas, Clock, Factory, Logger, Metrics, um, Vectors, Adapters, Gestures, sh Shader and Stencil Instructions, Async Data Loading, Virtual Keyboards, it's restructured text, um, it's got a little utils platform to handle some OS dependent issues. Um, other core instructions include audio, you get full video and audio using GStreamer, um, camera, access to clipboard, OpenGL, image, you've got a spelling, you can access spell complete and spell checking, text, video, input providers. So it's a real full set, full set of tools you have with Kibi. Okay, let's look at some of these. This is a really, really awesome one called Metrics. Basically, Metrics abstracts your device screen. Um, so, and it allows you to set coordinates in, in, in whichever way you want. So you can set them in points, you can set your coordinates in millimeters, centimeters, inches, d density independent pixels which is really nice. What that does is it detects basically based on your display um, what one pixel should be. Um, on some very high density screens like for example the S4, one dot is tiny. So Kivi automatically scales that according to your, your device's density so you get a very consistent way to specify coordinates without having to care about that. Also get a very nice coordinate called scale pixels. What that does is that also considers your, your device's uh, font, font um, setting, font scale because basically all your different Android devices and iOS, they come with a different font scaling. So by using the SP, you get basically a consistent way to specify what the user expects as a small font, as a large font. Um, you know, if you use an absolute size for a font, on high density screens, it's gonna be screamingly loud and big and your users are gonna typically look at that and say, wow, why are you shouting at me? So scale pixels or SP allows you to specify your font sizes and your coordinates in a way that that's respecting the device's native font size. Very nice, makes it fit into your device and, and adopt you know, um, its aesthetics, if you will. So really nice. And as I said, you, you can specify almost any coordinates using these anywhere in Kibi. I suspect that magic is done also through the event binding. Um, for the, um, but yes, it's very nice to have such flexibility. So it, it really does it well. Um, another nice thing that why it's so much easier to use than most other platforms or operating systems that use, or sorry, languages I should say, is that you can specify your font size in height. So it's, you don't have to do this conversion between points and inches and millimeters and all that. It's your height. Simple as that. So if you want it to, for example, to take up half the size of your screen, you just say font.height or font.size equals half of your window height. Boom, it will be the same on that all devices. So really simple. And uh, when I look at that, I think like, what are other people thinking when they make it so hard. Kivi really makes that easy for you. So another really nice thing that works in combination with that is the ability to... You've got five minutes left. Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to get through it all, but that's the logger. It, um, so you can basically just log all your densities. There's your factory, which basically just gives you a way to register classes. And everywhere in your Kivi app, you can instantiate them just using the factory. There's a utils library, which gives you your total uh, selection of returning the OS, so you don't have to... You don't have to care or go through all these hoops to find out whether it's in Windows, Linux, Mac, iOS. It will tell you. Um, okay, um, compared to other cross-platform options, I mean, even assuming that those GTK, QT, PyJamas, even assuming that those weren't just widget sets, they still all have their problems, and you really have to care about the different OSs and package them. So Kivi takes that away from you because it gives you your own look and feel everywhere. Uniform because it's not depending on your local widget tool, tool set. It's giving you what is what is your app and basically looks the same everywhere. So there we can see some graphs, just the downward trend of GTK after the GNOME 3 sort of debacle, disaster. Um, QT also hovering, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the future of QT and the ownership and the, also the, the, the licensing of QT. WX also very dismal there. There you go, you can see Kibi going up and up. Um, 
And even Guido loves Kiwi. In 2012, the Python Foundation gave Kiwi a 5,000 rand, 5,000 dollar grant to speed up the Pi 2 to 3 um, move. Glad to say that's almost done. Currently, the master, the master trunk is basically Pi 3 compatible. When the next release of one, Kiwi 1.8 comes out, that will introduce a Kiwi official Python 3 support. So nice to see that's on the way. Um, yes, so with all this yummy goodness, why should we not use Kiwi? Okay, there's about three reasons only that I can think of. Wanted to run in a browser? No, that's JavaScript, I'm afraid. Number two, I need to use OS-specific features like SharePoint or you know, Apple iOS services. Yes, you can do that to a point. Um, Kiwi comes with PyJamas, which allows you to do your Java calls. I think there's something similar for iOS. But um, if you're really going to integrate into your iOS, into your operating system that much, there are probably better choices just to use a native language and platform for, for, for the OS that you're catering for. Um, level three, um, the, the high-level document support is, is not really complete in Kiwi. There's, it's got RST, restructured text. So you can do some nice looking stuff, but currently doesn't really do HTML or PDF. Um, of course, you can. It's very easy to ask the, o I, the operating system to open those documents for you. So it's still doable. It's just they just can't be embedded in Kiwi at the moment. Um, so, but if that's not an issue for you, um, there are really a lot of reasons to use Kiwi. It's a portable, full-stack, mature framework. It produces really exciting um, applications that are fluid, fast, built for mobile from the ground up. Provide you with complete OS abstraction. It's got a rich history, which you can see in the design and the way they've handled everything in Kiwi. You really look at it and you go, wow, yes, thank you, that's nice. I really enjoy having that feeling w after working for it for a long time. It's released under MIT, so it's commerce friendly, hosted on GitHub, so if there's an issue, you can do your own pull request, get it fixed. The devs are really helpful there, they're really active, the forums are active, so the support you get with Kiwi is also really, really nice. It's got a high quality code base. I mean, I've seen like some also big discussions on pull request where they really insist that things are done well and correctly, and all the core devs you know chat and, and get involved in that. So it's a really nice code base. You can see that through looking looking through it, and it's got a growing, vibrant community. So as a developer, I really love it. It's great to be able to work in Python, and know you're going to run everywhere. It's very productive, flexible, and it's also really motivating. Our team, I mean, knowing you can write it and run it everywhere for your devices, you really get that feeling that, wow, this, is, this may be the last language and platform I ever need to learn. It's really nice. Um, yes, plus the OS license makes me all fuzzy. So yes, that's all I want to say. I hope, hope you go out and look at it. Really look at the apps. When you see the apps that are there, the quality, um, you know, there's the Particle Panda, there's, um, Sure, I forget the names, but there's a lot of really exciting apps. Um, Icarus Touch is a really nice one. Ele uh, keyboard, musical keyboard done with touch. Um, really impressive. Um, so there you can go and look, read more about Kiwi. Kiwi.org is the main website. There's a gallery you should go look at. It's also, they're hosted on GitHub, so if you want, you can just um, clone your local repo and start using it. There's a, that would typically be your dev option when you're working with basically the current master. If you don't, you can, there's also a package version of 1.72, which is their stable one. So that's me. In closing, I just want to say thanks to the whole Kiwi team. It's a really awesome thing, and especially to Tito, T-Shirt Man, and um, Quanon. Thanks. It's a, it's a good question. It depends really, is it important to you to feel and look like every other app? You know, if you want to like write a Windows app and you want it to look and feel like a Windows app, no, Kiwi's got its own look and feel. Um, but if you want to make a really exciting app, it's something that looks different, that stands out, you know, um, it's a real differentiator and you can get it in Kiwi much faster than you get it in, a, I think, any other framework. Um, I don't really think so. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the base libraries for Kiwi actually come like, for example, it uses Pygame to do the OpenGL stuff. It uses GStreamer to do the video. So they do draw on a lot of projects, but from not from what I gather, they, they don't make any effort to take it outside of Kiwi. But as I said, I mean, it's, it's under the MIT license, so you would be free to actually just pull out that library. It's all Python files. Some of it is Cython, um, so some of the libraries you may not be able to work. But given the license, you, you put, it's a pretty much a free for all. Sure. Um, we'll have, have about one, 